lots and lots of robots around here. I'm trying to remember where this one comes from. Of course, it's all done by magnets. And the bearings need to be uh, improved a little. Sorry, the battery just rolled out. Toys are great. But pianos are too slow. That is, I'm too slow at playing the piano, so um, most of the time when I uh, make a piece of music, I play it at half speed on the piano and then uh, play it back on the tape recorder at twice the speed. Of course, now I can use a software like Sound Design to do the same thing, but um, I used to do this before we had, before computers seemed fast enough to keep up with audio. Those were a joke because our lab director has four clocks on his office wall. But you know, they're really very cosmopolitan Tokyo, Rome, uh, Belmont, Brookline, Cambridge, and Marblehead are, of course, all in the same time zone around here. That's Gene Roddenberry and the crew of Star Trek The New Generation. And uh, there's Dan Quayle somewhere in there. Uh, Dan Quayle was a space enthusiast, as everyone knows, and uh, this was a uh, event at his home which had the crew of S Star Trek on one side and the Mercury 7 astronauts on the other. And it was a great party and people were swapping all sorts of tall stories, and uh, I'm not sure uh, whether Dan Quayle understood that Star Trek wasn't real, but uh, he actually seemed a very smart diplomatic person at this occasion, anyway. Gene Roddenberry, John Gene Roddenberry was an old friend, he just died last year, and we all miss him, because I felt that uh, he was about the only person who introduced anything thoughtful into television. Well, not very thoughtful, but compared to uh, all the other stories that the public is being shown, at least each Star Trek episode had some idea worth thinking about here. That's my wife Gloria having dinner with the Emperor of Japan the week that we were in Japan to get the Japan Prize. Here's Gloria and two of the children, Henry and Julie. And there's another daughter, Margaret, who's not in this picture. My daughter, Margaret, and her husband, Oliver Steele. But you can't see them because of the giant dog, Silas. Yes, that was in my father's office. He was a eye surgeon. The eyes are very close to the brain, so you had to know something about that too, I guess. The thing comes apart into quite a few pieces, but I'm afraid to touch it because it's so old it might fall apart. But pianos are too slow. That is, I'm too slow at playing the piano, so um, most of the time when I uh, make a piece of music, I play it at half speed. Yeah, like Margaret the, rubbed it from some cathedral near Exeter uh, in the southwest of England, mm -hmm. Salisbury or somewhere. When she was very small, it's quite an achievement because it's about a good deal bigger than she was. surplus uh, test missile. 
Oh, this is the manual? There's the operating manual for the thing. <laughs> Shipment, storage, and destruction to prevent enemy use. Oh, great. I haven't actually carried out this procedure yet, but I'm sure we'll get around to it one of these days. <laughs> It's a book about a mad scientist? Yeah. It's popular in Europe. Well, this was the first confocal scanning microscope, which I built in. Everybody is very impressed with holograms. More surplus. There seems to be a lot of round stuff around here. I just love mechanical gadgets. That's, hmm. a, that's a piece of half-inch magnetic recording tape. It's just sitting there waiting for suitable occasion, hold disk drive. What's the secret of life? What's the difference between living material and inanimate material, dead material? And as far as all the scientific discoveries of the last couple of centuries are concerned, there doesn't seem to be any mystery, any special element. A cell is a very complicated piece of machinery. Uh, it has, uh, even the simplest bacteria has a thousand uh, different kinds of proteins in there, and each of them is engineered to do uh, some tricky little job. And uh, I find it amazing that uh, you could make a cell that reproduces itself with just a thousand genes, but that's what the situation seems to be. No one understands all of that, but we understand about half of, uh, for example, E. coli, about what 500 of those genes do, and uh, another few years we'll understand the rest, I suppose. A lot of people have a problem with the idea that a person is a kind of machine. I think that this is a kind of prejudice against machines. Now the brain has, uh, I think, a hundred billion brain cells. Uh, most people don't know what a, a billion means, but it's a large number. If you have a cube which is a thousand units on a side. Then each face of it has a million of these units. Think of it as little squares. And if it's a thousand deep, that's a billion. Doesn't seem like so much if you think of it as just a cube with a thousand inches on each side, then it's a billion cubic inches. And a brain is uh, maybe a thousand times more complicated than that because each brain cell has uh, hundreds or thousands of connections to the other ones. So is that an insult? If I say that you're a machine with a thousand times a hundred billion parts, thousand trillion, a hundred trillion parts, uh, well you don't know whether to be insulted or not. Uh, if you thought of being made of a uh, hundred trillion grains of sand, that would be an insult just a big pile of dirt, but uh, we don't know how to think about such things. The most complicated machines that a person can understand, I think, might have a couple of hundred parts, like the inside of a teletype or, or something like that. And so if you get used to uh, understanding the meaning of word, of a certain word in terms of, of a few examples, and then somebody says, 
you could use the same word for this enormous colossal structure uh, I don't think the mind accepts that and uh, they still think that when you say the brain is a kind of machine it's it's still some uh, silly little clanking wind-up toy and people don't like it a lot of people say I can't be a machine and you say why not and they say well machines can't think and then you say well how do you know machines can't think and the answer boils down to well machines are very simple we know just what they do and thinking can't be anything like that thinking has to be mysterious it's it's not just mechanical so this isn't an argument this is saying that whatever thinking is it can't be understood and so if somebody talks about making a computer program to do something I think the general reaction most people have is that wouldn't work because the things computers do are too simple they're too clear and understandable now that's silly uh, people uh, if you have a computer program that has a million instructions and if those instructions were all written by different people then you got a very complicated system and no one can understand it but we're used to the idea that uh, that the programs that you get are designed very carefully and they do exactly uh, some particular job and so our stereotype is based on accident that is it's based on just knowing very simple computer programs and assuming that anything a computer could ever do will be just like those simple things the project to make a robot build with blocks came before most of the ideas in the society of mind we decided that it would be interesting to see if we could get computers to do things out in the real world in the early 1960s and so we had to do a lot of engineering to build interfaces between television cameras and the computer and mechanical hands so we had to make a machine that would find some blocks and build something with them and the programming problem was basically we had a table with a lot of objects and we built an object I guess a good example would be that and then we sh confront the machine with this scene and say build another one most of this research was very hard long projects to do the simplest kind of thing that you'd think that any intelligent being would know how to do without even trying it but then if you watch what a 18 month old child does or a two year old child uh, any afternoon when it's playing with things you, you see all sorts of you see the child doing this and moves it over and falls off the other way and it goes on for a long time and if you if you slow down the video and watch the hundreds of experiments a kid will do every uh, few minutes then when people talk about the attention span of a child you realize that uh, they do things that very few adults would ever dream of working that hard on. And so you learn a lot about planning and uh, I think even more the child learns to visualize things that we never talk about like <coughs> what's it going to look like if I put this on? What will I see? I'll see two blocks on a big block. Now, being able to anticipate that is a very important thing because if you can't anticipate the effects of actions in your head, then you can't plan multiple steps ahead. And again, if a robot's going to learn to build, it should be able to do that. I 
Okay, right. the film starts with a picture of a early robot arm that was the uh, mainframe was designed by AMF uh, after they made a fortune building bowling ball pin spotting machines uh, in, in about 1965. Uh, okay, then this young man who enters the scene is Bill Gosper. Uh, he has been described by Donald Knuth as the world's greatest living 19th century mathematician because he did all sorts of uh, stuff on continued fractions and theories of fast computing pi and uh, others, other stuff that no one else knows how to do. Too bad it only has one hand. No one in AI has built a robot with two hands to this day, as far as I know. This is our PDP-6 computer that we used for the first research in robotics. Oh, this is seeing a block manipulation task from the by looking inside the mind of the robot. And here's the external view where we see it grabbing a block and putting it on another one. Cubes. Here is the vision system very slowly tracing the outline of a cube to find its uh, nine visible edges. And it got all nine of them, which is not too common, it usually gets seven or eight maybe, and guesses where the rest are. And that's, that's all. In this case, the hand has uh, very sensitive force detectors in its wrist, and so when the uh, stick hits the bearing a little to the side, the machine realizes that it's off-center and it sends a signal to the table which has motors in it that uh, rotate the uh, screw until it fits in the hole. Uh, it's very important to have either this kind of feedback or some sort of compliance uh, flexibility in the arm or else things will just jam like if you pull a drawer out too far and push it. Scott Fallman wrote a master's thesis very much about this sort of problem. Suppose that you wanted to build this structure. We have a robot with one hand. That was nice because even after you understand that you have to start at the bottom, if you build it the obvious way, it won't work. And so Scott wrote a program that planned ahead and considered many different possibilities. And it did finally solve that one by doing this. Oops. Couldn't do that. <laughs> it would do that, and then it would put this one here, and then it would put this one here, and then it would take this out. We were very proud of that. But never did anything else that I know of. You could say, pick up the largest green block supported by the block that is next to a red block. In, in Terry's idea, a sentence is this triggering off ideas of various sorts, and some of them are about sentence structure, and some of them are about content. If a sentence starts with pick, it could either be choose something or lift something. And as soon as it comes to that choice in its dictionary, uh, it also has a rule which says you can tell the difference by looking for the word up. And if there's a word up nearby, it doesn't have to be right away, uh, then it's probably lift. But if there's no up, it's probably choose, like pick the one you like best. He didn't make the distinction between syntax and semantics that has paralyzed the almost half the world of linguistics.
I spent lots of time when I was a child learning how to how to build things. And, you know, see how far can you go? And I thought all that was behind me, but then when I was a graduate student at Princeton, it turned out that every evening there would be a coffee cup piling contest. couldn't just leave it there. I mean, it's the same thing in Shakespeare. If you have a story like Hamlet or Macbeth or something like that, all sorts of interesting things happen, and you kind of build a big tower of complication, and then you can't leave. So what you do is you have a big fight, Romeo and Juliet, and then right at the end, everybody gets killed, and the reader goes off with a feeling of relief, because you don't have to worry about what happened then. People want to say, want to ask, what holds this all together? Is there something in charge? The problem is that, of course, there's something in charge, but that something might be terribly dumb. It might be uh, a bunch of circuits that are listening to other agencies and recognizing which of them is yelling the loudest. And so when people say, isn't there a self that makes conscious decisions, the question is, what could that thing be? Uh, if it's very complicated, it's got to be made of parts. If it's very simple, it's rather undignified. And probably the final decisions are made by uh, very simple uh, weighting systems where one part of the system is pulling harder this way and the other is pulling a little less hard that way. And so the very top level decisions have to be trivial. It's, uh, people want there to be something very grand at the top but there couldn't, because nothing grand can be very small and point-like, and like a little pearl in the middle of the brain that's very wise. It couldn't know enough. What would it mean for a machine to be conscious? And the answer is always, I don't know. And so there's a whole set of questions that are directed at the difference between a human and a machine. People say, there's got to be a difference. The machine just does things, the human feels, it, uh, it thinks, and even it has some magic part called a soul. And all of the arguments against machines as an explanation of thinking are really questions saying, well, if all it is is made of parts that interact in a certain way, then how do you explain all the things that people know about their own minds. And then they expect to see a short answer. The answer is that as we've spent the last 40 years experimenting with trying to get computers to do things, every now and then we find a new way to write a program and we get another little aspect of lifelikeness. It seems a little more uh, toward that goal. And maybe there's another couple of hundred years of, of figuring out other things. We can't answer these things in one second. The brain has been evolving for 400 million years, and uh, we've been trying to imitate parts of it for 40.